it's uh, kind of a brand new talk. Um, it's the first time that we're giving it uh, together. Ceci spoke about uh, Kotlin and Swift before, but uh, we're aiming for uh, this agenda. So we're gonna share a little bit about the motivation. By the way, I walk a lot. I hope I don't get anyone dizzy. Um, we're gonna share a little bit about the motivation. We are uh, quite curious. I think um, many people working in tech share this uh, curiosity. So we're kind of mad scientists at heart. So we designed an experiment. Of course, it's an app. Uh, quite simple app, but uh, it's an app. We're going to share about uh, those details, what we uh, found during uh, this experiment, and we're going to finish with a couple of uh, ideas worth sharing. Hopefully we'll get uh, like 30 seconds for questions, but uh, let's see how it goes. So let's uh, join us in our DeLorean, buckle up, because we're about to speed up to 88 miles per hour, and travel a couple of years back in time. Back in 2010, I was the co-founder of a small development studio in Guatemala. I think we were the first one doing mobile in Guatemala or in Central America. And of course, that wasn't our first idea. We started as a startup with a product that didn't work. So we pivot, didn't work, pivot, and eventually we ended up doing mobile. Um, my co-founder ch uh, chose the iOS path and I went with Android. And it, it, it's funny because I was Fresh out of business school, I was the one with a, a business background, minor in marketing, so picture me fresh out of the classroom trying to sell something to um, people that wasn't aware that mobile was a thing. So there were many challenges during the way, and mostly because I was doing both development and also trying to, to sell our, um, our apps. I noticed that the, the, the clients were looking to uh, have some mobile presence, but not invest that much of their budget. So it was like a, this uh, bargaining and negotiation, negotiating over different uh, terms in order for, for something to be meaningful for both of us. Elemental Geeks was my company. We were developing, and also the clients we were lucky enough to uh, land several uh, big clients. But on the business side of things, they, they wanted iOS first. Remember 2010, so Windows Phone was a thing. Um, most of the people deciding were using BlackBerry, so we were aiming for several platforms. On the other side, on the tech side, it was a big challenge to decide like a, a, a common architecture. Um, many of our developers, we were a small team of uh, around 12 people, were uh, uh, deciding where they wanted to aim their career, so many of them didn't want to work on BlackBerry or Windows Phone. So it was a challenge on many different ways. So since we travel back in time, let's start with where I started. I also started working at a small startup. And um, one of the challenges that we constantly have is that we have uh, really small teams that hi were highly specialized in one specific, a specific platform. So whenever one left, it was really hard to say, OK, let's move one developer from the Android side to the iOS side and let's make this project keep working. It was really hard to do that, and it was almost impossible because uh, developers were, had a preference for a specific platform or because they didn't have experience with the other language. So it's really hard to be able to move people from one team to another one. Uh, well, back in back on that time, we used to use Objective-C and Java, so there were completely different languages, and that movement was really hard. And uh, as time passed by, I also moved from company to a bigger one that's, uh, um, we had a larger team and we also kept having kind of like the same pro problem. Um, when I started at this company, I started as a Android software engineer since that was my main experience. And uh, I constantly heard that um, if you look at the higher level, both platforms should have kind of like the same functionality and the same implementation, but for me, it was really kind of like distant because I only knew Android and iOS seemed like they have really particular things on how they did things, so it was really strange for me. But then, uh, they actually gave me a chance to move to the iOS side to experiment a little, a little bit mid in there. And when I did that shift, it was at first a little hard because Coming from an Android world, I was uh, accustomed to use object-oriented programming, and there were a lot of things that I used to do in Android than on iOS work, maybe completely different, like using map filters, 
and uh, protocol-oriented programming and functional programming. So that was really kind of like, what am I doing here? But right now, after a few years, uh, when with Kotlin on the door and Swift uh, more mature, then I see more uh, the first comment that they told me, like both platforms at, at the end zone are very similar and there are just minor differences whenever you do an implementation in Android and on iOS. So it's easier to move one team from one team to another one. So uh, throughout our, all of our mobile experience, um, we have seen how mobile has been evolving. Like I said, at first, Objective-C and Java were completely different and really hard to move from one place to another one. But right now, Kotlin and Swift make it a little bit easier. So uh, Google, at first we were a little bit skeptical about Kotlin because it wasn't kind of like a first language on Android. But when Google launched uh, said that Kotlin was the first language on Android platform, then we, see, we, saw, we started to see all of the possibilities of, that we could do. So we decided to do a little experiment and check if it was really possible for two people who work on different platforms to do kind of like both platforms at the same time. Um, so we started to, to establish what was the experiment. We needed to determine what were the ingredients of our experiment and well, okay, what could go wrong? Uh, we had some things in mind. First, we needed to establish what we needed to build. So we decided to have something that was simple and that was easily understandable. We didn't want to have kind of like a big application with a lot of use cases. We, we wanted to have once something that was easily explainable. <coughs> we also wanted to uh, go out of our comfort zones. At the end, we both work on a specific platform each, of, each day and we wanted to do something different. So uh, we decided that we will probably mix it up, use some new technologies that we hadn't used before and see how it went. And we wanted to have something that we could share it afterwards. Um, so let's continue. So um, uh, it was something like this. I was like uh, staring at Xcode, then staring at Ceci, Xcode, Ceci. I wasn't wheeling my tail, but anyway, it, it was a, a tough challenge, mostly because uh, we're not used to using the other tools, both the language and the platform. We cheated a little in terms of uh, having some previous experience. As Ceci mentioned, she was an Android developer doing Android full-time for a couple of years. I work a little bit on, on iOS, mostly on Objective-C, uh, mostly because when you are a founder, uh, one day you are a code monkey, the next one you are uh, making coffee for everyone at the office. So we had uh, several challenges doing this. We were aiming to build like this beautiful Jenga tower with the pieces right in place, so if at some point in the future we had to carefully remove one of those, this wasn't supposed to be any issue at all. But uh, as we all know, in software that doesn't happen. So there were many challenges in the way. Luckily for us, uh, things worked out. It was a really simple app. We're going to see it in a, in a minute. But um, otherwise, we wouldn't be here, or we would be like doing magic tricks, or juggling balls, or rambling about Jenga. Anyway, so we love dogs. Those are my one-year-old puppies. Manchester Baron von Puffendorf on the left and Seymour Teobaldo Schumpeter, the greatest names ever, Chesito and Toby. So because we love dogs, we decided to go with a dog app. So to build our experiment, we started to look at different APIs that were out there because we were not going to try to make our own API for this dog. And we tried to see what APIs were out, out there. We saw movies, superheroes, Star Wars, a lot of APIs. But we, since we love dogs, we found this great API that's called the Dog API. Uh, the data structure of this API isn't as complicated. It's pretty simple. You just return strings of URLs of dogs. And you could ask some random images. And you could specify the amount of random Im images that you want. You also have kind of like the breed list if you wanted to do something with, with it, but we just uh, chose this um, endpoint. That's get random images and we specified the amount of images that we wanted. So the UI is in Polish because we, were, we, we didn't got to that part. 
Uh, but this is on the right uh, or on the left for you. Uh, it's the Android application and on the other side, it's the iOS application. Uh, the idea of the application was a simple game that you could, uh, we will show you some images of dogs and you had to guess the breed that was at the top. So if you see on the iOS side, we wanted to guess what was the shipper key and obviously I don't know which one it is. <laughs> Uh, well, doing this app, I figured like, yes, I love dogs, but I actually cannot identify any breed of the dog. Um, it had also uh, another screen that was the scores. So after uh, several kind of like rounds, you get to store the scores on some local data source. When we started to, de to do this experiment, we tried to discuss uh, what was the best approach to discuss about the similarities and difference between the both platforms. And uh, you could look at it in different uh, angles. You could look at it in terms of the language. If they have similarities or difference in each one of them, you could look at them in terms of the platform, like uh, what elements are similar, like, I don't know, uh, view controllers and fragments or core data and SQLite. And you could also try to achieve it through uh, how you structure your app in the different layers. So we saw that um, on the most upper level, that's uh, the UI. We wanted to keep that really a specific per platform because we know that uh, iOS has some specific ways of doing things like table views and how you register cells and Android also has some specific ways of how you build the UI using XMLs and some sort of binding. So we didn't want to mess, up, mess with that layer. We also try to avoid the lowest layers. For example, the remote service, we know that each platform has its own preferences on what libraries or elements to use in order to implement that. So we, we said we were not gonna focus on that. But we said that we were gonna try to focus on trying to have uh, some shared approach in terms of the middle layers, the ones from the view controller to the lower, lowest layers. That were the layers that we tried to make it similar. So many decisions at this point. When you work at a, a medium to big company, there are many of these decisions already taken care of, or uh, maybe if you are like uh, in the development team, there's a tech lead or engineering manager, or there are many other roles to consider when taking these decisions. We're just two, so it was supposed to be easy, but when, when you're working at a small startup, a small startup this happens uh, quite often when, when deciding. So we're looking for uh, something that at some level made sense in both platforms, without reinventing the wheel. Um, so we went with MBBM with an implementation of clean architecture, something similar to this diagram. There were two things that we were looking forward to uh, grab uh, from the API and store in our local storage. So we have a remote service for uh, grabbing the URLs from the dog API. We use Retrofit and Alamo Fire on these two platforms. And for the scores, we used a local data service because it was really simple. We ended up going with uh, a dictionary, shared preferences, and user defaults in, in the platforms. Then there's the repository. Funny thing, when I was doing a little bit of research for, for this, I, I'm used to uh, using the repository um, pattern. For some reason, when looking at iOS samples, there were uh, there were almost no mentions about repository and there were many use cases or interactors because this was really uh, quite straightforward. We decided on not adding uh, another layer of interactors or uh, one per use case. And we'll have the repository communicating with the view model that doing a binding with the view using live data in Android and a manual binding um, in iOS. And the communication in the lower layers in Android, it's uh, built using Kotlin coroutines and using closures and delegates on iOS. So basically, we built this from the ground up, thinking on looking for similarities. And even before it started coding, we, uh, like a, an educated guess, we noticed that the similarities might be here, like in the uh, data layer, instead of here especially the layout, it's completely different. So among the way, we found some similarities and some differences. Yeah, uh, it's 
usually very interesting to try to see the similarities and difference between things, people, and everything around life. So for example, uh, Adrian and Eve, we both like berries. Uh, I like more raspberries and he likes more blueberries. Um, True that. So uh, even though we both like both, we have some sort of preference from one to another one. So during this experiment, we wanted also to try the, to find those differences. Maybe I like more a little bit of Android things. Maybe I like uh, some things that were more specifically to Swift. But that was our goal, to find like similarities between both of the languages. So uh, when we did the experiment, we found some obvious um, lookalikes. For example, how we define variables. We both have like var and val and let and var. Depending on the platform that you're using, we both have optionals. Well, it's not called optionals in Kotlin, but at the end, they serve as the same purpose to uh, guarantee the node safety. Uh, the way we define control flow, it's also pretty similar. So uh, we we are easily under we can easily understand the other platform in terms of control flow, how we define variables. In terms of collections, we both have uh, a functional approach. So collections tend to see pretty similar. So for example, here we have a method where we have an array and we try to convert it to a string, removing all of the nulls. So on the top we have the iOS uh, function. And as you see, we can use the flat map to remove all of the nulls from that array. And then we join using a separator that's a space. And in Kotlin, it seems pretty similar. Uh, the only difference maybe it's the name of the function that we use to get to remove the nulls and how we join the strings, but you can easily understand like what's happening in both platforms by just looking at uh, how we define these both methods. Uh, another thing that's pretty similar uh, that's usual is doing typecasting. Um, <clears throat> in Kotlin, you have the operator that is to determine what type is a certain uh, a spe a specific object or thing. And in iOS, you also have this operator, uh, even though it's not in the slide, iOS also has that operator. Also, uh, both platforms have the as operator uh, that lets, lets you cast from one type to another one. Uh, you should always use kind of like the question mark in order to guarantee a safe cast, otherwise you might have um, cast, a casting error in Kotlin and in Swift. You, you can use it as long as you are we're really, really 100% sure that that's the type that you're gonna get. Um, another thing that's really common in both languages and it's really used a lot, uh, at least in the iOS side, um, is generics. Generics is not something new. Generics is something that started around 1970s and it has been widely used by many languages like Ada, Pascal, C++, Java, and many other languages. So it's not something new, but uh, it's really powerful because you create an implementation that's um, independent of the type that you're doing. Uh, so that allows you to you do, do reusable code. Reusable code node in a sense that, uh, let's say you have three implementations in three different files and then you put it in one, one, one only file that you reuse in all, all of the other implementations. In this case, it's really code that's independent of the type so you focus more on the implementation. Uh, no, uh, the power of generics comes from decoupling the type from the implementation. So it's implementation independent of the type. Um, I'm gonna talk one specific use case that we use on iOS. In iOS, in the um, UI, we tend to have like a lot of boilerplate and we repeat a lot of things whenever we're trying to handle table views, collection views, and uh, a lot of things. And uh, there's a big tend to use generics in order to simplify that part of the code. So for example, here, uh, whenever we try, we want to use a table view cell in iOS, we need to define those two lines at the top. So imagine if you have m many cells, then you will have many lines there. And instead of that, by using generics, we're able to reduce it to just one line of code. Um, so that's one a specific use case for iOS for generics. Keep in mind that uh, we were trying to, to achieve these similarities and we were switching between platforms and helping each other, especially because uh, one of our goals was trying to uh, check if this was possible. Even at a, at a small scale, we were just two, but uh, we we're trying to, to achieve that. So 
here are a couple of uh, slides from our uh, data layer. And in both cases, for the remote service and for the local service, we were able to write almost the same code. There were a couple of things that um, gave this out, like uh, Kotlin or uh, Swift. Here we have a name argument where we, can, we could have uh, changed that to it, to the keyword it. But basically, the, the similarities are, uh, are, are there. And I, I want to, to be very specific about that. We were trying to achieve that because otherwise this code might look different. That actually happened to us. We were doing the same, but without enough communication. We were writing, using the same tool, the same language, some different code. So we're not saying that the same code, the same syntax is going to, to be always there, but it's easier to identify this if we, if, if we communicate as a team. Um, uh, well, in this case, we're grabbing the, um, from the API a list of strings and um, parsing the read from the URL with a substring, then building one of our data objects called dog, and uh, then choosing a random element of this list to be selected. From the uh, data source, we were grabbing the, um, the dictionary. Uh, the um, key value implementation was name and score. We needed to uh, sort this by the score. So basically, we noticed that the, at, a, at a glance, the similar similarities are there. Obviously, as we walk towards the UI, the, the top parts of our, of our um, architecture, these uh, similarities are going to begin to fade. And although we didn't try to look for extreme similarities on our code, um, I remember reading an article that uh, on the repository and on the data layers, it's around 80% when you are looking for it. I mean, when you're trying to write almost the same code, you can achieve like 80% string similarity between the two languages. But when you move forward to the view model or the presenter or whatever you're using, it reduces to 50. And of course, the, the last part is going to be almost completely different. And speaking of differences, we were at first looking only for similarities because we think it generates some value for both the developer and the team and eventually the business to be bilingual in Kotlin and Swift. But we noticed that there are several, uh, several differences between the languages. We both, Ceci and I, like roller coasters. The, the thrill of being a ride, it's incredible. But for some reason, we enjoy this in a different way. When we are doing the line, there are almost like really long lines for riding this at the amusement parks. C Ceci is like jumping uh, in excitement because we're about to get into the, into the um, roller coaster, and I'm not. I'm quite frightened. My palms are sweaty. Sometimes I get dizzy. And I'm, I'm really suffering through the, the whole way until we get to the car, to the roller coaster car. Once I'm there, I just throw my hands in the air and I'm enjoying the whole ride. And let's just say, says it's not doing the same. Well, in this sense, both languages have several differences. The first one that we would like to share, it's the enums on Swift. These are quite powerful, are first class types. And uh, you can have almost everything that uh, is also provided by, a, by a, a struct. And the idea here is that because we can handle state, it's common to see a pattern much similar to this code where you are returning a result enum handling the both, uh, both, both possible cases, the success and the failure. Unfortunately, in Kotlin, we have the Java enums that are not as powerful, but there are a couple of ways of handling this, especially the sealed classes. Yeah, uh, like Adrian said, uh, using enums in Swift are really, really powerful, and I wanted to try to achieve the same thing on Kotlin. And I was trying to uh, collaborate with Adrian to figure out if there was something that was uh, pretty similar to the nums on Swift, and he mentioned these seal classes. Seal classes are also, are classes that are, are able to maintain a state, and they're pretty much an extension of the enums. Uh, seal classes allow you also to have uh, subclasses in it, as long as they are defined on the same class that you're, uh, as long as it's defined on the seal class. And uh, another thing that's pretty interesting is that you can also have uh, only getters, getter, get attributes, in the seal classes by adding the val um, keyword. 
to, to that class. Uh, structs, structs is something widely used on Swift. Um, in general, um, we use structs when we want to have immutable, immutability, and uh, Kotlin doesn't have this. Uh, in, whenever we use structs in Swift, uh, and you pass it through a method or you define it on a variable, you're actually creating a copy of that, uh, not object, but element. So if you're not careful how you handle this, then um, sometimes it has happened that you are building an application and you're trying to maintain state through a struct and you forget that it's value-based, then uh, whenever you try to figure out if the state is the correct one, you see that it's not the right one that you want because you decided to use a struct instead of a class. Um, the structs, um, Deciding to use whether to use a class or a struct for your data is a decision that's not trivial, and the results in the different in the, and the result in the implementation varies a lot. Um, I don't know. Well, um, something important here is that the decision that you make in Swift between a struct or another object is going to have a um, a couple of uh, drawbacks forward in the, in the process. So it's really important to choose between a st uh, struct or an object. And uh, in Kotlin, there are no structs, but we have data classes. The, the difference might not be obvious at first. At, at this talk, we're just trying to cover as much ground as possible, but um, there are several implications between data classes and strokes, even if the end result is the same. Yes, one common use of structs and data classes is whenever you're trying to consume uh, data from an API, so you usually use some sort of, well, uh, at least I use some sort of library to help me with uh, networking, it being Alamo Fire or Retrofit, and you always, always kind of like need to map it to some sort of object. On Java, we used to have um, classes that were full of getters and setters, and they were like really huge, uh, but with data classes in Kotlin, then that got really uh, simpler, and you, with that definition, you already have the getters, et cetera, that you need, depending on if you define it as val or bar. And in Swift, we also use the structs for that specific same purpose, uh, to parse the information that comes from the endpoint and have it as immutable, and that's something that we could use in the rest of the app. So uh, these both classes are similar in some way, but different in terms of passed by reference or passed by value. Um, protocols is something that it's also really used a lot on iOS at first. Uh, as I said, my main experience was, was Android. And on Android, I was used to having uh, object-oriented programming, inheritance by uh, creating classes and subclasses. And when I moved to the iOS side and started to watch protocols because Apple promotes using protocol-oriented programming. It was really confusing for me and I didn't see the value of it until I started to use it more and more and more. And now I see that the protocols are a great way to achieve uh, composable, composable objects and uh, increase the functionality of things that I need and to guarantee that some functionality is created as, I'm, as it's expected. Protocols in iOS are also kind of like first class types so you could also send protocols as uh, parameters, you could send uh, protocols as results, and you can use protocols in uh, everywhere you want. Um, this is one common use of protocols in iOS. It's to increase some functionality. In this case, it's the reuse identifier to be able to get a view controller from the UI, from the storyboard. As uh, protocols, something um, closely related to Swift, and even if we have uh, interfaces in Kotlin, it's not going to be the same. Not exactly that, but something similar happens with coroutines. Uh, this is some, some topic that it's, uh, for, for me it's really interesting. I would like to ask everyone for a quick show of hands, how many of you are using coroutines right now in your apps? In production? Okay, still it's, it's uh, a lot. Thank you. Um, well, coroutines have been around for a while as a concept, by the way, I don't know why this is not named with a K. That would be amazing. Coroutines. Kotlin? Coroutines? Okay. So anyway, if you haven't heard of this before, it's a um, non-blocking way of handling asynchronous code. 
but the code looks like it's synchronous. Instead of blocking the whole thing with a thread, stopping a thread, we're just suspending a function. Suspend, fun, but we want to have fun. Well, yeah, my bad puns are real terrible. So uh, in this case, we're working with retrofit and with the await keyword, this is going to suspend while we grab the data and once everything is ready, we're going to check if it's successful and then return the result. In the, th this is on our um, repository. In the view model, we're going to launch that coroutine using a special scope for this in order for um, the lifecycle to be aware of whatever is happening with this asynchronous code. And because we are uh, handling the UI, we need a special context. That's why we have a with context block in order to work with the main thread and handle the UI. Both dog list and current, current breed are mutable live data objects, and we're setting the value here. Coroutines have, a, uh, in my opinion, have a bright future ahead, but although it's an old concept, we're still uh, like uh, learning on how to implement this. And as a community, as the Android community, we are new to coroutines. So I'm hoping to see many new use cases and best practices to develop in the coming months. And there are a couple of other things that are not exactly part of the language, but uh, are like in a middle point between the, the platform and the language, like coin for dependency injection. The thing with coin is that you don't need to learn how a coffee maker works or uh, deal with a pump and a thermosiphon or all the, the things that uh, are in the Dagger 2 sample. Dagger 2 is quite powerful. Dagger, Dagger is it's quite powerful, but coin provides several um, ways and alternative ways to implement the dependency injection. And as easy as the code that you see here, it's all the dependency injection that we needed for, uh, for our uh, feature of the game. It, it even supports the view model, and uh, this is all the module that uh, we needed to specify in order to do the injection, and this is the injection itself. So COIN provides several advantages, and it's not that there are no other ways to do it, but this seems quite straightforward and uh, ha have a small, has a small learning curve. Also, there's live data. In iOS, if you want to do data binding uh, or a bind between the, the view model and the view, you need to use uh, reactive extensions, either Reactive Coco or Rx Swift or KVO. In Android, you have live data. And um, again, it's as easy as this. We're observing a live data object. And when it uh, changes, it triggers this event. So we up update the UI. Both of these um, specific um, things made the, the whole process of working with uh, this architecture in Android much, much easier. And to finish with this uh, differences, there's also memory management. As uh, we mentioned before, we're trying to cover a lot of ground here, so no much detail into this, but basically Kotlin assumes that there's going to be a garbage collection, and Android works with uh, concurrent mark sweep, so it traverses the whole object tree, marking which objects are being used and which not, and then sweeps all that are not being used. The thing is it's that it makes a pause, like holding everything for a second, preventing the allocation of new objects in order to check all the um, dynamic allocation on the heap. So with this approach, we have uh, several drawbacks. Uh, one of them is that uh, because it's grabbing everything that's not marked, it's the, the um, uh, available space is going to be fragmented so Android implements a, a compact mark sweep in order to defrag this and have all the available space together. But still, we are pausing everything. And if we have a lot of uh, dynamic allocated objects in the heap, it's going to, uh, our app is going to suffer. In Swift, I'm working with iOS, we don't use this. Instead, we use our automatic reference counting. It doesn't pause everything. It, there's only a counter to check how many times there's a, a reference for the, for the object. But this might imply that uh, a couple of uh, cyclic reference exist. With uh, concurrent mark sweep, that doesn't happen. But with uh, ARC, this is a, a one of the many problems that uh, it um, presents when working with it. And also, 
we depend more on the developer to understand how weak references work. In Android, we almost don't use weak references at all. So keep that in mind when dealing with the memory. So basically, that's the, those were our findings. And um, we would like to share a little bit of, uh, of the lessons learned here. Still have like a couple of minutes to go. And experiments are fun. We really enjoy the process of, of doing this. Keep in mind that we didn't have a time constraint or a budget or uh, even like uh, many of those constraints that are present in our day-to-day uh, -day job. And multi-platform, cross-platform, it's an interesting topic. I mean, back in 2010, we implemented several apps, and I'm not proud about this, using PhoneGap. This was way before Apache Cordova that, uh, like, in some way, uh, make things better, but, but still. Since that time, I've been a strong native development advocate, but uh, eight years later, we're still discussing this. And currently, at many conferences, there are many um, talks regarding this specific topic. I truly believe that becoming bilingual is something that can, can provide some value in uh, different terms, even in, in natural language. I've been doing public speaking in English for a couple of years, and I'm still struggling with a couple of things like uh, doing jokes. I mean, I can do terrible puns, but, but still, the, the audience is different. And although I think I'm able to communicate a point, it's not the same than, than doing public speaking in Spanish, but it has opened my way of thinking and understanding the community in different ways. The same thing happens with programming language, and especially with a couple of programming languages that are so similar, like Kotlin and Swift. It can broaden your perspective and easy the process to understand both platforms. Eventually, we end up developing some empathy for both uh, teams working on these platforms. Keep in mind that the software is for people, developed by people. So becoming bilingual requires commitment and trade-offs in order to reduce the overhead. Um, we usually have kind of like an Android team and an iOS team, and each team has its own like style guidelines and its own uh, way of building things. So in order to, to reduce the overhead to switch one person from one team to another one, there, we have to come to a place where there are trade-offs for each one of the platforms. It's, it can either be on the style, how, how you write code, or on how you structure, architecture your app. If there are no trade-offs in this, then um, it's probably, you, you could actually do it, but it's gonna take a little bit more of context switch whenever you try to switch one person from one team to another one. Um, also, that doesn't mean that you do not need platform experts. Of course, you always need persons who know, have a deep knowledge in one specific platform, uh, but it also, uh, having a bilingual team allows you to pull and reassign as needed. So probably maybe on Android you have uh, some technical dev that would require kind of like two or more developers that they're not available right now. Uh, but on iOS side, maybe there's like, uh, we're kind of like maybe slack enough and we don't, ha we don't have a lot of work. So maybe you could actually pull from one from the iOS team to the Android team. If there's a pool of developers that are kind of like bilingual and understand both languages, at some level. Uh, also, bilingual understanding of the language can reduce uh, implementation bugs. Sometimes you probably are implementing something in Android and you ask your uh, iOS team, like, how do they implement it? And maybe they are doing something and they just give you a big, broad overview of how it's done, but you do not have kind of like the implementation details. And uh, as a lot of persons say, it's like the devil is in the details. So maybe they put it on their wrong um, uh, lifecycle method or they put it, they implement it in a different way, like they got the first one and not the last one. Um, uh, so being able to come to your teammates and say, okay, uh, maybe you can look at this file and actually understanding the code that the other person wrote could actually reduce the implementation box that you have in, in your code. So, uh, going further in this uh, road, there are a couple of options. Um, I assume most of you, if not all, are Android developers working on Android apps. So if you really like Kotlin and Swift, you might look for a transpiler in order to work with, uh, with Swift. I don't recommend this option that much, mostly because 
there are many differences in the language. So a transpiler will automatically translate the code from one platform to the other. There are several options. You can Google it or uh, check in on, on GitHub. To my knowledge, all of them have several flaws in terms of uh, lacking uh, some implementations. So after doing the transpiling, you will still need to check the code manually. Instead of, uh, of a transpiler, I would recommend to learn the other language. And even if you are not working, currently working on an iOS app, it's important to understand the platform as a whole. If you need or want to get into developing for both platforms, there are another couple of options. There are many actually, but I would like to recommend Flutter. Although it's quite new, I think it's promising, especially on the UI side. The working with widgets is interesting. Um, the only thing is that it's going to like switch your uh, way of thinking because uh, architecting an app in Flutter, it's quite different. And of course, my heart is with Kotlin Native. I really like Kotlin. And I think, again, as there is a long way ahead, Kotlin Native is going to provide a, a way to implement cross-platform uh, apps working all the uh, business logic in Kotlin and the specific on each platform natively. And uh, for some reason, there are people uh, advocating for Clutter, that's with a K, Flutter with Kotlin instead of Dart. To be honest, I don't really like that, but I think uh, it, it works. So basically, these are the options that we would like to suggest on uh, going further. I think we have like 30 seconds to go. So um, uh, in a nutshell, we did an experiment. It went uh, good. We learned a lot. We shared a little bit of, uh, of those learnings. And um, as I think, we are running out of time. If you have any questions, we're going to be around uh, the day, so feel free to grab us. And would you like to add uh, anything else? No, no? Well, thank you very much.